Everybody ready for the word? Yes. Yes. Amen. After I preach it, then you might say, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> We're going to see. It's an interesting story in the Bible. So let me, this is my title. And then when you'll see my message, you'll, see, you'll understand my title. Isn't Jesus all powerful? Yeah. Why? Then why? Okay? Then why? Then why what? Well, in, in Mark's gospel is the only place you're going to find this story. And I want to talk about it because I, I find it very interesting. I looked it up, um, uh, these different these scriptures and concordances and, and uh, not concordances, and, and uh, commentaries. And none of them that I read said what I'm about to tell you. But they did say some interesting things anyway. But okay, let's go to the story. When, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? Okay. First off, he takes this guy out of town. It's about the only place that I know of that um, somebody he's about to heal, he removed him from the crowd and took him out. So everything I'm about to talk to you about, which has to do with what we see, and, uh, but everything I'm going to talk to you about and anything that you're going to do to go to like a next level in the Lord, the Lord's going to take you out from the crowd. He's going to take you away from your family, take you away from people. And He's going to bring you to a place and He's going to begin to do something with you. Now that doesn't mean He's going to just bring you off to Chicago or something, you know, or New Jersey or, or even Israel. It just means right where you are there could be a crowd of people but you're going to be all alone as God begins to deal with you. Amen? It's going to be your revelation of what God's trying to do inside of you. So that's what He did. He took this man out of the village. He went out probably with just His disciples there with Him. And then he, he made some spittle and he put it on the man's eyes and he laid his hands and he said, Can you see now? The man looked around and said, Yes, he said. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again and his eyes were open. His sight was completely restored and he could not see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away saying, Don't go back into the village on your way home, okay? So, if you back up to my title, I say, can he do anything? Was he all powerful? And you said, yeah. And then the next thing was, then what? Then what is this story all about? And it's only in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, you know, in, but there, there's a lot of really great things that's being said here. But he lays his hands on this man, and when he, he can you see, all right? And he says, I can't see them very well. People look like trees, blurry. And then, this is my two parts, he could see everything clearly after Jesus laid on him a second time. You know, I have a lot of different things that's happened in my life to give me what's going on here. And one of those things was, and I was talking to Daniel this morning, is that when we were in Gatlinburg just past um, October, Got there, and on that Monday it, it rained, but it wasn't storming, but it rained. But up on top of the mountain where um, um, Klingman's, Klingman's Dome is, anybody ever been there? It was snowing, all right? So we didn't go up that day, though. We went looking around and, and uh, driving around, taking pictures of the mountains down low and seeing the color changes and all that stuff. And so the next day we went up to Klingman's Dome. We were going to go up on top of that tower. So as we drove up the mountain, because you're going up the mountain, and uh, right before you, you, then you make a turn and start heading on another seven mile road or something like that just to get to the parking lot. But as we were going up, it was clear, okay? It was clear and then we hit this fog bank and it was literally the cloud that was around the mountain. So as we drove through it, it got, it got pretty thick at one point, it got a little bit scary, you know? But when we popped out the other side, it was crystal clear and it was covered in snow. So, yeah, we started down below, below it, even though we was up on the mountain, and we were just seeing little bitty patches of snow, wasn't much. Then we went through this cloud and we came out. So my point is, is that in this story, we see that this man could not see too clear when Jesus touched his eyes the first time. 
So it was either his power was diminished, which it was not, or it was deliberate. And it wasn't so much deliberate for this man as much as it was deliberate for you and I. Okay? So every story in the Bible and everything that Jesus is doing is for the people he's doing it to or with. And, you know, and, and they got healed and so forth. And he did different things with the people to heal them and, and so forth. One time with the blind man, he just said, do you believe I can do it? While other people, he just laid his hands on them. Okay? He didn't ask this guy, do you believe I can do it? So every situation in Jesus, the Bible says that if every one of them was recorded, there would not be enough books in the world to contain I mean, just everybody he touched and everybody he healed, you know, and he was, he was laying hands on people all the time. But, so here we are at Dunes Mountain, and we're below down here, and we see, okay? I mean, everything you could see was pretty good. You can pull off the shoulder of the road and take a look at the mountains, and, you, and if there was any animals there, you could see them, because we saw some turkeys at one spot, but it wasn't up on that mountain. And, uh, and so... When you got into that fog bank, kind of like this guy, you could still make out things on the side. You could tell you were still on the road. It wasn't completely fogged out. You know, I could see ahead. I could see the taillights on the people in front of us and so forth. But everything was really, really cloudy. All right. So here was this guy. He gets his eyes touched. And Jesus said, what, you know, can you see? He says, I see people as trees. You know, they're just like stick people. But yet I can see them and they're moving around. So it's like a fog bank. Even over in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes and he says that um, right now we're like, we're looking through a glass cloudy. And, but then we shall see face to face. The cloud, the glass is going to be removed and we're going to be looking at Jesus face to face. And what was he saying? He was saying that right now we read the Bible and it's a little tough sometimes to interpret you know, what's happening here, his parables and so forth. And uh, even the apostles in Matthew 13, after he finished saying the parable to the people about the sower, then the disciples pull him off to the side and go, why are you speaking to them in parables? And really what they were saying is, why are you speaking to us in parables? You know, they, they didn't understand either. But then he said, your eyes are open so you can see. And they were like, we don't see. And your ears can hear, we're not hearing. You know, even they didn't understand. But what he was saying to them is that, come with me, now I'm going to tell you the interpretation of this. So what he gives at the end of that, that, that parable in Matthew 13 is given to them only. The interpretation. While the rest of the people, there was thousands, I guess, out there. And, and he, was, uh, he quoted from Isaiah where it says that they have eyes but they don't see and ears and they don't hear. And their hearts are beating but yet they are wax gross. In other words, their hearts are dead. And he's talking about their spiritual eyes, spiritual ears and spiritual heart. You know? But he told the disciples, you do see. But you're not really seeing. So he explained. Once he explained, they went, ah. Oh. So that's what it all means. You know? So we need that interpretation. And so I'm, I'm tying all of this together to just talk to you this morning about what's going on inside of your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and what do you see? You know, when you read your Bible, do you see these stories taking place? Do you understand what's happening? No, we don't in many cases, because we need the Holy Spirit to interpret them for us. But do we even want to know? He's not really going to uh, just pull you aside and say, let me, let me tell you what you're reading. But if you're really hungering for it, he's going, to, he's going to talk to you about what you're reading. Like the woman that put some leaven in, in the bread and it leavened the whole lump. And beware of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees and talking about their doctrine. And, and there's a lot of, lot of other parables and stories that, you know, people read and they just, they never come back to read them because they didn't understand them. But if you want to understand, like he said in Matthew 13, at any time those people decide they want to understand that I will convert them. Different translations say, one says healing, one says convert, one says make it, make it known, and so forth. But <clears throat> anyway, there's, when you get saved, the first process that I see that happens is, is that you're not going to understand much of anything. How many of y'all read your Bible? How about, how about more than once? Do you remember the first time you read it? 
Did it make any sense? You know, I, it didn't make any sense. And I was, when I was reading it, the whole Old Testament, I wasn't saved when I read it. I got saved reading Matthew, and then the rest of it I read after I was saved. So the Holy Spirit was there, the beginning to show me things. But it took about, I mean, I don't know, but I would say about five times through before things started really standing off the pages. It wasn't like trees anymore. They began to be, oh, that's what that means. You know, even in John chapter 2, what the, the, um, the wedding in Canaan, at the, towards the end of the chapter, he, he's in the temple and the Pharisees uh, come to question his authority and so forth. And he says to them, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. And then and right after it you read that it was later when the disciples were filled with the Spirit and so forth that then they understood he was talking about his body. Okay? And now in, the, in 1 Corinthians it tells us that that we, our body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? You know? What does that mean? That the temple has been destroyed, 70 AD, it was wiped out. You know, it's interesting, I want to say this, a little side note, that Jesus told the disciples that not one stone would be left upon another that wouldn't be overturned. Well, when they set fire to it, the gold ran down and got between the rocks, and so they flipped them all off to get all the gold out of there. But it's interesting, and I, I've been to Israel twice, and I saw the rocks, okay, that's around one of the walls at the base of that, when you look at the Jerusalem, you see that big wall. And I forgot which side it is, it might have been the north side, but there's these big blocks of stone. And I saw them, and I wondered about them, but the other day, well, I know it's been a few weeks now, we watched this um, video on this archaeologist that goes over there, and he writes books and stuff. And he's sitting there talking to a rabbi, and he's talking about that scripture that not one stone will be upon another. And he says, now, can we find any evidence of that? And he went, and the rabbi just looked at him kind of weird, and he went, we're sitting on them right now. Yeah, they, they didn't just topple them over and leave them on the Temple Mount. They flipped them until they pushed them completely off the Temple Mount, and they're piled up. And, and when it registered, it's like my eyes open after two times going to Israel, it wasn't a big deal. I didn't catch it. But when he said that, I went, oh. I put my hands on those rocks, just wondering inside myself, you know, where did these rocks come from? They're all just piled up. They pushed them off the temple mount, and they're rocks from the temple. Wow, huh? where the glory of God would enter into that temple and those rocks, if they could speak, they would witness that glory of the Lord coming into that temple. I went, I gotta go back to Israel now and be more alert. Well, you know, it's another thing that I'm saying is that, you know, I am forgot how old I am in the Lord, like 43 years now, it's 1980, and uh, <clears throat> I still, we're, every time God starts to show us something new, it kind of works the same way as what we see here. First you just, you read it, and you're like, wow, it grabbed my heart, but what's, what's it about? And then as we continue on, He begins to open our eyes to see. And that's where some of you are right now. Maybe I could say all of you, or someplace in that. Things are happening in your life. And, and you don't have much understanding about what you're seeing. Why is this happening? Well, you know, I read the story, and if you, if you were to read this story, you know, for your first time, you'd like, you might be taken back a little bit like, why it took Jesus two tries to get this thing right? Over here, it took him like instantly. He didn't, some of them he didn't even touch. Be it as unto your faith, and their eyes open. You know? Lepers cleansed. The lame walking. The deaf hearing. You know, sometimes he, he shoved his fingers in their ears and stuff and then they started. Maybe he just had too much wax. I don't know. But anyway, he healed them. Alright? And so that's what happened in here. And that's what to me is so important about the story. Like I said, it's only in this one spot in the entire Bible and you could easily just pass right over it until somebody makes mention of it. But usually when they make mention of it, they're confused. Why it took him two tries? To me, 
that story is like, I'm not going to say more important than any story, but it draws my attention more than like all these different blind people healed that's written in all the Gospels, you know. Some of them write the same story, you know, and so forth. But this one really catches my attention because it's only at one time. And then the Lord began to speak to my heart. You know, and I said, well, Lord, why'd you take him out of the village? He said, because when I work on my, my people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate you from your friends, your family, from the religious thinking, what, you, what your friends think about Christianity. I'm going to separate you from all of that. And I'm going to talk to you alone. No matter where you are, laying in your bed at night, sitting at the kitchen table with your family, out with your friends doing something, and you've got this this tugging in your heart by the Holy Spirit to stir you up to just say I need to know so here they are talking to you and all but you're just off in la la land just this thought anybody ever experienced that? Well, am I the only one? <laughs> Amen here in Matthew 25 I'm going to show you a few little things, but I'm not going to preach on these things. I'm going to say a couple of things, but I'm not giving you the whole story of what's going on here. But here in Matthew 25, I love this, this whole story having to do with the wise and the foolish virgins. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of ten bridemaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Well, the five foolish ones didn't bring the extra oil, and the five wise did. So when it came time for the Lord coming, they could put the extra oil in and trim out their lamps and, and go and meet the Lord, okay? So the whole story there, I got YouTube vids on me preaching about what this whole story is about. But all I want to catch your attention to real quick is that there's two groups of virgins, okay? So if they're called virgins, well here they're calling them bridesmaids. I should have used the other translation and then you would have saw virgins anyway. So they're virgins. And if, if to be called virgins means that they're saved. Paul said I'm uh, in the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, that I'm bestowing you upon um, your husband, which is Jesus, as chaste virgins. What that means is that, that you have been made holy. All your sins have been wiped away. All right? As if you've never had sinned in your life. Alright? So, that's what it means. So anyway, the idea is that there's ten of them. So they're all virgins. They're all actually Christians. They all have lamps. That's their light to the world. So the whole story, like I said, I'm not going to really re-preach it again. But I'm just got to give you a little detail. So, but here's the deal with these ten virgins. Now, <clears throat> they know that... They need to go get this extra oil because they never know when the Lord's coming, okay? So he might come in the middle of the night and we've got to make sure that our lamps work. Now that means simply that as a servant of the Lord, we need to be busy. That's what it means. So I need to be busy. If you jump up to 24, you'll see that that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. I, pr I firmly believe that because it was, it was people writing the Bible that put chapters and, and periods and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't that way. It just ran straight through. But I don't know why they would have they broke the two chapters because it ends with 24. That's where it should be. 24, the end of that should be into this chapter. It said the good steward, the good servant, is feeding the other servants that he's been given in charge of. And the, the, the wicked servant is beating those servants, ripping them off. We got a lot of that going on in, king, in the kingdom of heaven here on this earth, which isn't the kingdom of heaven, it's just worldliness and uh, evil. And, uh, but the good servant is going to feed and doesn't charge anything, okay? It's freely given and I freely give it, all right? So the idea is that these, these wise virgins every day are making sure they got the extra oil so that if the master comes in the middle of the night, they could trim their lamps out. The foolish ones just did not see the importance in it. So they're virgins. So my thinking is, if I'm going to use this for my message this morning, then what I'm saying is, is that these foolish ones are not seeing very clear. Are you with me? 
All right? When I see empty chairs and churches and it's all over the place and people live in, I see that those people that believe in the Lord, or had believed in the Lord at one time or whatever, that aren't going to church anymore, they, they don't see any point and purpose of going to church. All right? They have lost sight that maybe their neighbors and friends and family know they go to church. And that alone might be the only witness that they have to some people. When we lived on Nancy Street, or Drive, or whatever it was called, before 17 years, and then Katrina came and we moved out from that street, there was our neighbor across the street. He said hello to me all the time. We talked and so forth. But on Sunday morning, when we all got in the cars and the kids, and he was outside, he would not even turn around to wave. That always blew my mind. 17 years I knew this guy. And never on a Sunday, I'd toot at him and he'd turn around and go, oh. But he never purposely turned around because we were, he knew we were heading off to church. He knew I was a Christian. He knew I was a minister. He knew I was pastor of the church. And uh, so on Sunday morning, he was convicted, I guess. You know? So he didn't know what I preached. He didn't know anything except the fact that, you know, I was, I was a good guy and I never cursed when I was around him and, and never drank and all that kind of stuff. So he knew those kind of things just in those years, but he never knew me as a, as a minister, and, you know, coming to church and preaching the message. But yet, he would never look at us when we was heading to church. So what I'm saying is, is that just going to church, when he stands before God, you see, he's going to answer for that. He's going to answer for those Christians that was trimming their lamps up nice and bright so people could see them. Not that we're trying to get puffed up, but the light is our witness. So we are the light of the world, it says in Matthew 5. We are the salt of the earth, it says in Matthew 5. You know, these things, we are preservative from God's judgment, and we are the light that's supposed to be illuminating Christianity. Jesus, our Savior. Amen? And so, so what we have here in the story is that... That idea is that all of them began to be the same. <clears throat> they got saved, they were on fire, they were excited about Jesus. But somewhere along the line, the wise virgins, after a long period of time with the master not coming, they, just, they kept on going to church, they kept on you know, worshiping the Lord, listening to Christian music, being, you know, being the best witness they could be, pushing away all the darkness from their life, the temptations and all of that. And they just kept every night going to get that oil. But something was different with these other virgins. They never ever grew to the place of understanding how important it is to be that light and that witness. You know, so well, you know, I go to church, I don't understand what that guy's saying. So what? The people down the street that see you gone and your relatives, they don't know you don't understand what's going on. They just see you going to church. I'm trying my best to make you understand. And uh, only the Holy Spirit can take what I'm saying and make you understand. But you have to decide you want to understand. <clears throat> it's not my place to make you want to understand. Okay? So I'm trying to use these examples to make you understand. That in every level in your life in the Lord, and every step you make, and everything you face, you're first going to see things cloudy. You're not going to have the understanding. But then if you want to, the Lord will touch your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and you'll see deeper in your life. And that will keep going, each level. When you get into a new level of the Lord, you're not going to understand it. You're just going to know that... You know, this level is faded. I'll be starting to get kind of bored and just going to church. I need a new church to go to. You don't need a new, new church. You need your eyes open. Amen. You need to see the purpose and point of being saved. Amen? Amen. All right. Matthew 8, 8 through 10. Now, there's, there's this centurion. And he comes to Jesus because he's got um, someone that's sick. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, the centurion replied. Jesus has actually told him, I'll come with you to your house. So he stops him. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So I'm coming into the story of what the centurion says and then what Jesus says to his followers. 
Okay? It says, Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be cured. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. <clears throat> to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following, I assure you I have not found anyone in Israel with so great faith. Now that's an interesting story. Because this guy's a Roman soldier, a centurion. But he's been observing Jesus, I guess, some kind of way that made him come to Jesus instead of to the false gods that the Romans were serving and the physicians and so forth. You know, some bloodletting, that's what they did, all kind of stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so he didn't go that direction. He came to Jesus. Now why? You see, this is, this is one of those things. Then why? Why? And what's going on here? Now, the disciples, the ones that were following him, he had a pretty large following, okay? So it was more than just the 12. And uh, there was at least 70 at one point that he sent out it by twos, 35 groups of two. And uh, so there was many people following. They were disciples, students, listening to the master teach. And uh, they followed him, and he taught them. And, um, you know, so they saw miracles and so forth. Well, evidently... In order for this Roman centurion to come to Jesus to heal his servant, his son, or whoever it was that was sick, he must have saw something. He must have heard something that he believed. But I'm going to tell you right now what has happened is that God opened his eyes. I mean, that's the only way. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal that kind of messes with my head. is that all his followers were Jews, and they all knew the Messiah would come. And so, God was beginning, I mean, Jesus, well, he's God, but God was beginning to open up their eyes. But every time the Pharisees would challenge it and say, yeah, it was healing by, the, by Beelzebub and so forth, the people started wondering. Well, and even, and even John, when he was in prison, which I can understand that, he was in prison, about to die, and he wanted to make sure that he did what he was supposed to be doing. So he sends his disciples to go question Jesus. And how does Jesus answer him? Well, they come to him and say, John wants to know if you're the one. He ignores them, doesn't even answer the question. He goes and he heals somebody with blind eyes, somebody that was lame, somebody that was deaf. And, you know, and, he, and he's preaching the word. And then he, then he turns to them and he says, what have you seen me do? Well, the blind eyes have been healed. The deaf is hearing, the lame are walking, the gospels preach to the poor. Go back and tell John what you have seen. That's the evidence. You see, you're not below the cloud, guy. You're above the cloud when you've seen me do this. But if you fail to see, then you're in a blurry place in the Lord. I mean, who is this Jesus? I'm asking you, who is this Jesus? You wasn't there. Did you see him get crucified? <clears throat> Did you experience what he went through, his beating? Did you see the crown of thorns on his head? Were you there when the Roman garrison all spit in his face and what that must have looked like? And on these cuts, he was punched in the face and they plucked his beard and the blood just poured. Were you, were you there? What are you doing here this morning? Something must have happened to you that, you're, that you got saved, that you got transformed. Something became clear to you. Not everything. You have much cloudiness in your life, and so do I still, after all these years. But little by little, the Bible says in Isaiah, line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. In other words, he's, lean, he's showing you things a little bit at a time. But you reach the place in your life that you're even here to listen to me. You might have been invited. You might have, you know, you come here and there. Some of y'all, you know, have things that are going on, so you don't hear all the messages. I don't know if you're going home and watching the video, because we're recording it right now. It'll be on YouTube. You know, I record Saturdays. How many of y'all see my Saturday message? And, uh... Not yet. 
Amen. I'm almost on part three of a five-part message on loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? So that, when the third one is up and running, we need to go and make yourself available. Amen? Or your eyes won't be clear because I, I do my best taking each part to try to make you understand how do you love the Lord with all your soul? How do you love your Lord like this last one? With all your strength. And I'm not going to preach it. You need to go listen to it. I mean, that's the only way. You know? The more that you desire to understand and make things available to yourself, the more your eyes are going to be open. The more you're going to understand. Right now, the church is so confused, they don't know what's up and what's down. They don't understand that they're embracing same-sex marriage and so forth, and they're only embrace, embracing something that God has totally have not, hasn't created. Man and a woman. Okay? But they, they are just, the devil comes with them with that love message. We're supposed to love. We're not hating them. You know, they're sick. We want to pray for their healing. If they're blind, we want to pray that their eyes would be open. Amen? If they're deaf, we want to pray that they will hear. If they come with something that's contrary to the Word of God, we want to pray that they come to their understanding and get deliverance. Amen? I mean, that's, I mean we're not being evil. We're just, you know. I watched. We were eating with the kids up in Mandeville yesterday. And behind us was these TV screens in this place that we were. And one of them, they were showing... These, these uh, men and women that had no legs, they were amputated or maybe lost them in war or something. And it was showing them weightlifting and doing things that you and I can't even do with our legs. You know, I mean? <laughs> you know? it was amazing. I was just spellbound myself as my grandsons were watching this too. You know? And I was just thinking, yeah, we can, we can adjust to life. And I was just thinking how the Lord would want to grow legs back on them. Now the power of the Spirit. Some had legs and couldn't walk. He said, take up your bed and walk. And they stood up and walked home. Amen. You see, so we can adapt. And that's, when you're down below the cloud and you only see limitations, you're liable to start adjusting yourself in that mode. Well, if I just get some glasses, I'll think, well, the Lord wants to heal your eyes. I have glasses. You know? Because my eyes started going bad when I turned 40s. Got to a place where I couldn't even drive without wearing them. And one day standing here, the Lord healed me and gave me back seven years. And I don't even drive with glasses on anymore. I see perfect. But I still needed to read. And I asked the, court, the Lord. Well, Lord, if you're going to give me seven years back, why don't you give me 40 years back? Why don't you put me back when I saw 2020 and everything was great? He didn't answer. Because it's one of these things. How do you see people? Like trees. I gave you back seven years because I want to increase your faith to believe for all the way. Amen. Okay? So, but the idea is that spiritually speaking, did I say idea? Yes, did. I did. <laughs> she said, how do you spell idea? And I, yeah. I spelled it correctly, but I pronounced it with an E-R. <laughs> And now I can't stop because that's the way I talk. So, what can I say? <laughs> so, what's going on here in this story? God opened up the eyes of a Roman centurion, but he didn't open up the eyes of his 12 disciples. Do you see it? I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. You know what the problem is now? This is going to be kind of a weird statement because the Roman was used to false gods and those religions type of things. The Jews were used to Judaism and used to the law, okay? And, but yet it was easier for God to open up the eyes of a Roman soldier who believed in multiple gods than what it was to open up the eyes of someone who believed in the true God, Jehovah. That's interesting. Sometimes the hardest ones to, to get to come up and see are those that have a religion which is a believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross and rose, 
it's easier to go out there and get someone unsaved to listen than it is to, for somebody in, in some other religion to talk to them, hey man, you know, you're believing in the law, you believe in you know, whatever, trying to get them to, to be able to walk in freedom and liberty. And that's what's happening here, is that <clears throat> the Roman soldier, was, it was easier for him to forsake those gods than what it was for them to believe on Jesus with all their heart. That's interesting. You know, so at times, the hardest ones for me to get to are you guys. I mean, I'm not saying to be mean, but I preach to y'all all the time and teach. I go to Teen Challenge and get a bunch of new students in there for 11 years, and they start asking me questions, and they wear me out, and then I give them the, the truth, and they get, oh. And I go, wow, I, I saw their eyes open. I saw them understand. Now these guys are in there because of drugs and all kind of else stuff. And I go in and meet them for the first time. I make a statement as I'm answering questions. That's what I do on Wednesdays for an hour and a half. And some of these guys don't even know their name because they're just there for the first time. They start asking me questions and when I answer it they go, oh wow, yeah, I see that. And I'm like, whoa, I don't hear that at church. <laughs> Sometimes I do, don't get me wrong. I don't want to, you know, beat y'all up. I'm just saying. I expect more out of y'all. That's what I'm saying. And, this, and Jesus would get so upset with his 12 disciples. Oh yeah, he was up on a mountain with three of them and comes down and all of his, the rest of them down there, which would be what? Um, nine. Was, they were trying to cast the devil out of a boy and they couldn't do it. And when Jesus shows up, <clears throat> the, the, the dad comes to Jesus and he says, My son, can you heal my son? He's got a demon. And your disciples been trying to cast it out and they couldn't do it. And he looks and he says, You rebellious generation. How long will I be with y'all? And I know he's looking right at his disciples. They all must be hanging their heads. He cast the devil out of the boy. Then later they go, How come we couldn't do it? Because that one only comes out by fasting and prayer. See, in other words, you guys aren't fasting and praying because you don't have the revelation. You don't have the sight. How do I know that he said that without me knowing when they said that? Because in the garden, he comes back and what he finds the three doing? Sleeping. Can't you just pray with me for an hour so you don't enter into temptation? They didn't have that revelation either. <clears throat> Amen? But the Roman soldier... Interesting. Now there's a couple of scriptures. You know, the Lord said, Woe unto you, Capernaum. And then he names a couple of other cities. He said, If what you are hearing and what you have spent, if what you're seeing was seen and heard in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth. Whoa. That's, that's insane. You know, let me say this. Now, don't take this wrong. But I'm going to say it anyway. This is straight for Daniel. No, just kidding. <laughs> if Jesus showed up in America, he would say, Woe unto you, Cincinnati. I'm just saying. I'm not saying they're all corrupt. New Orleans, Shelmet. He would he'd say, Woe unto us. That if the, if the stuff that God has been doing in America, to prosper America, and, to, and from our founding fathers that came over here to worship the Lord, was done in China... But Japan or Iran, they would have repented. You know why? Because in China and Japan and Iran, the Christians are rising up. The Christians are praying and they have been seeing miracles and signs and wonders. How about Africa where eyeballs are growing in their blank sockets by ministers just preaching the simple gospel that we, are, we, get, we get bored of hearing here in America. Was that strong? But it's true. It's true. Our prosperity in the Lord's has turned into prosperity of entertainment. And so, we have reached a level in our life that we can't see through the cloud. It's too thick. And what is the Lord saying? He's saying, come up. Just go through the cloud and come up. You think you see everything right now, you haven't seen anything. 
from a bird's eye view, but you got to come through the cloud. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10 says that the Israelites all went through the cloud. That was the cloud that came with them during the night, during the day actually for the heat and the fire by night. They all went through the Red Sea, baptismal, water baptismal. A rock followed them and poured out and they still complained. So they didn't see. Joshua and Caleb saw, but the other spies, ten of them went, the giants are too big. And they all died right in front of everybody. These little Pac-Men came down and ate them. That's what I see. <laughs> yeah, this, this mist came down on them and it consumed them. The tent. Then they all went, let's go. Let's take the land. Too late. Too late. Tell them, don't go. I'm not with them. And they all died off in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua wound up leading them into the promised land to do what God wanted to do 40 years earlier. You know, you see, if we're not careful, we could die off in the wilderness. If we're not careful, we might never see what, what we need to see. If we just get too caught up in this world, we're going to be too blind to see God's got stuff way beyond this. Way beyond your money, your television, your cars, you know, your vacations, way beyond all the stuff, you know, that he wants to show us. You know, Julie and I say, we're ready for another vacation <laughs> because I'm tired of everything that's going on around us. The Lord's saying, what? You ready for another vacation? You don't need a vacation, you just need me. Amen. Amen. And we hear him say it and we plug in and, and then we get content and peace because our eyes start opening. Here in John 13, 6 through 10, let me, let me just think about this one for a second. Then he came to Simon, Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Are you washing my feet? Now Peter's sitting there, Jesus puts on an apron, he starts washing the disciples' feet. They're at that last supper, Passover supper, and he's about to wash the feet of Peter. Okay? And so... He gets to Peter and he says, Lord, are you, wa are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now. Okay? But you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Yet, he expected him just to let him wash his feet. But he told him, he said, you don't understand now. See, you're below the cloud. I'm thinking about the mountain and Gatlinburg. You're below the cloud. You're just seeing cloudy. All right? And there's nothing I can do now to make you understand that. Well, when he, you know, basically, he could have just made his mind open up and understand. But that wasn't the plan for God for them. It was going to be later on when they were filled with the Spirit. And Peter's eyes were open. And the power of the Holy Ghost was upon them and in them. So then he tells him, you won't have any part with me, Peter. So then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And so Jesus says in response to that, Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. But the idea is that, sorry. <laughs> the I, uh, dear, dear. <laughs> I don't even know if I can say it. I mean, forget it. Scratch it off the video. Anyway. <laughs> she, she was a school teacher. She's going to teach me how to talk. That's all there is to it. Anyway. The idea. The idea. Dear, uh, I am saying uh. Uh. I don't know what I'm saying. You had to go tell me that this morning. <laughs> now I'm messed up, man. I tell you. He who is bathed needs only to, to wash his feet. So the I, so I'm going to shift that word. So the thought here, that's a, and did I say that one right? I hope so. And the thought here is this. Wow. Help me, Lord. So the thought here is, is that Peter didn't understand, and Jesus even told him that. 
You don't understand now what I'm doing, but you're going to understand it later, okay? And so he's like, man, I don't understand what you're saying, but, but I, want to, I want to be with you. I want to have part with you and so forth. So here, wash all of me. No, you still don't understand. See, you all have been made clean. How many of y'all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You have been made clean. But, to, but you have need to wash your feet. What does that mean? It means that you have sinned since you've been saved. You have walked to spiritual places that you shouldn't be walking to. We all have. I'm guilty. God has made a way. It's called repentance. To be washed clean by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have been cleansed. But, you know, let's just look at it this way. You know, you watch a program on TV. Clean TV movie. Just a movie or something. No, you know, it's not evil or pornography or anything trash like that. It's just a movie. You're still, you still are watching and listening to worldliness. But you're not, it's not evil. You're not going to die and go to hell for it. You know, but your feet are going to get dirty. I mean, that's just the way it is. So you're still clean. You don't have to get saved again. You just need to repent. Not so much about that program, but the worldliness gets into you. You know, it's amazing to me. I, I have watched at least 10 movies in my life. Times a million. I don't know. I have watched, especially war movies. I've seen probably all of them. And, uh, and so forth. And YouTube vids on it and everything. And I would go to bed at night, and I just talk to the Lord until I fall asleep. And movie quotes come into my head like crazy. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough when the enemy puts the, the filthy stuff there. But movie quotes, I'm, and then I'm finding myself thinking of that movie, thinking, wait, he should have done that. Wait, wait, what am I doing? It was a movie. <laughs> well, I have learned a little lesson on how to kind of keep that from happening and that is wash my feet before I go to bed and I don't mean I go in a bathroom and wash my feet probably should but anyway <laughs> the idea is that is that you see I might not even have watched a movie it's, it's movies that I have seen that come popping back into my head and I know that you know the, the maybe it's the devil or maybe it's just my mind I don't know but it's, it's sidetracking me from worshiping the Lord. So what I do to wash my feet is I make sure that I read some Bible or, or listen to some Christian music or do something that gets my mind into that mode. And then when I go to bed, believe it or not, I don't have movies popping in my head. You see? See, Peter couldn't understand what, what Jesus was doing. He's talking about our feet, our walk, our walk in this world. People are going to talk to you about all kinds of stuff. And you're going to think on that. And some of them they're going to talk to you about is going to be delivered from the enemy to sidetrack you. And you need to wash your feet. Because your feet will get dirty. You'll walk in a path that you shouldn't be walking on. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with watching movies. Okay, but some of them you probably shouldn't. <laughs> you know, as simple as that. You know, but the idea, the thought is, well, I got to really work on that. But, but the thought is that this is worldly. People say, what's wrong with listening to worldly music? She came in with a Led Zeppelin shirt. Boy, did you bring back memories. Whoa. But I mean, it's not evil. I mean, maybe some of the songs were, you know, especially Black Sabbath I used to listen to. But anyway, the, the deal is, is that, you see, that can flood back into your mind. And I was a big Beatle fan. If I walked in a grocery store and, they, and the music was on, I mean, as soon as I walked in, I could have looked over and said, let me tell you, and I would name the song. I can name that song in three notes. <laughs> Remember that program? It's all still here, you know? Until I get to heaven and get all it out. And like I said, it's not that it's evil. It's just the, I, I, the, just the thought. I use that word a lot. Huh? I am messed up now. But anyway. The thought is, is that it's just going to sidetrack you. It's going to, give you, it's going to get you dirty feet. They got a song that was called... Fire and Ring by James Taylor. 
Anybody ever heard this song? First song I ever danced to in my entire life. And I have heard it a few times over the years in the grocery store, believe it or not. And I remember that it was like I was transported back to that party when I danced for the first time, you know. We got things like that to remember a, an event that's tucked away. And, you know, so something can trigger it. And the devil knows every one of them that will trigger you off track from worshiping, from praying, from just trying to go to bed at night. He knows every one of them. So if you don't take advantage or do something about it, wash your feet, and just override everything with like some Christian song, just listen to that, read a little scripture, do something to be the priority thing in your thinking, then you're wide open. And even with that, you could still wind up getting attacked. Okay? So Peter didn't understand that, but he did understand that if he doesn't wash my feet, I have no part with him. In other words, if you don't make your Christian walk deliberate, then your carnal nature will rod. I mean, we all have it. And it's been rotting, you know, not most of my life now, up until I was 22 years old, it was in charge. And so it took a long time, and even now, after 43 years, that's like almost double before I was saved, it can still, it's still alive and kicking. And somebody cut me off on the road, can find out real fast. <laughs> I'm better at it, amen? I've gotten really good at it. Lord, bless them. <laughs> amen. Here in Mark. Now we're back to the same place where the story was, but it's right above the story, which brings him into that story. And he left him, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand, is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves of five to five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They, they said to him, twelve. Also when I broke the seven uh, for the four thousand, um, how many large baskets? Um, a fragments did you take up and they said seven so he said to them how is it you do not understand so they're in there in the boat and he starts talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and um, that's the last one and they find out because he finally explains to them it's the doctrine it's the doctrine of the Pharisees you got to be aware of. That's the leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven's kind of like a, a picture of sin, how it just will puff you up and so forth. You know, but they didn't understand it. Oh man, it's because we don't have any food. All we got is a loaf of bread. And he's like, I just fed a multitude of people with seven loaves and a few little sardines. It wasn't whales, it was sardines, it was little bitty fish. And he fed all these and picked up all these baskets of fragments left over, you know? And here they are, they, and they're not really responding to him. They're talking to each other. Oh, man, he's upset with us because we only got one loaf of bread. You know, first off, when you fail God, you repent. He already knew you would fail. Hang it up. Quit wallowing around in self-pity and repent. Let him wash you clean. You get dirty, you don't go and say, I'm so sorry, I'm dirty. No, you go in the shower, take a shower, and you're going to clean again. Let him cleanse you. Get up. Walk in the Lord. Okay? So here they are, having all this glorious revelation happening to them with the multitudes that, that Jesus fed. And they're sitting in a boat, hoping Jesus doesn't notice that they only have one loaf of bread. <laughs> and he's just sitting there going, I just will go sleeping on nets. <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? Don't you have any understanding? 
You see, as Christians, we need to understand He loves us with an everlasting love. You've got to understand He didn't die for His sin, for His own sins. He had none. He paid the price. He took the handwriting of ordinances that was in the law, which would have condemned us, and He nailed it to His cross. And every time we fail and we repent, it's taken and brought to the cross and nailed. So it doesn't come up in your life. Don't you understand what He has done for you? Don't you understand how much He loves you that He didn't have to come down and die on a cross? You know, on that video, it showed that hole right through His hand, which most of us know He was nailed here. It would have been a hole anyway. But it's just kind of funny. But you can see right through His hand. There was a nail that was there holding Him in place so you could walk in freedom. Don't you understand? He had a crown of thorns so you can have a sound mind. Amen. Don't you understand? He was beat so you wouldn't have to be. And I'm not talking about you might, you might get beat in this life by somebody. You know, if, we, if we're here right on to the tribulation time, it could get very violent for Christians. Some places it is violent. But that's not the case. I'm talking about being beat up by demonic spirits. I'm talking about having demons just having at you anytime they feel like it. Because the devil had control of us. But Jesus Christ set us free. Amen. The devil has no access to us, and he doesn't turn us over to the devil to discipline us. Believe me, God knows how to discipline his people. Amen? Amen. And so you need to have that understanding. You see Jesus sitting there going, Guys, give me the loaf of bread. <laughs> you know? And when they got there, they could have had a basket full of leftovers after they feasted and couldn't even move anymore. You know, just <clears throat> no understanding. They were below the baptismal Holy Spirit. They were below that. And they could only see with their carnal minds. And as hard as they were trying, they still, everything he said, they were always questioning it. Jesus said, I already ate. I have food you know not of. Who brought him food? This is in John, you know, 4. And he, and he says, listen, no. To do the will of my Father is food indeed. You see, they just couldn't get it. And even after seeing all these miracles, they still couldn't get it. You know, but they got filled with the Spirit. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. You know, you might not be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you have the Holy Spirit. It's what's, it's what's keeping you. It's what's convicting you. It's what's empowering you to be a Christian. It's the Holy Spirit. It's His power, okay? And He wants to bring understanding to you. And we say dumb things just like the apostles. But Lord, you just don't understand. I keep falling over the same thing. And the Lord say, I don't see anything recorded up here except this last one. So I say, well, Lord, I fell a million times. It's not recorded. Why isn't it recorded? Did you ask for forgiveness and mean it? Yes. Well, that's why it's not here. If you really want to go find those, you'll have to go back to the cross because that's where all your failures went. I love you. And I care about you. And I just want you to simply to really understand when you repent what you're doing. And I'll wash you clean. Stand up, please. There's always a reason why Jesus is doing something. Always a purpose and a reason. He's obeying the Father. Took the man outside of the city and opened his eyes. Took two steps to do it. See, there's a reason for all of that. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can make you understand it. If you're reading and you read a story and say, why he did that? And if you really want to know, he'll bring you above the cloud. And you go, oh. So that's why. I might be the one that reveals that truth to you. Some other teacher might. Some other older Christian might. Or just strictly the Holy Spirit. No matter what, it's the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. Now close your eyes for just a second. And I just want you to ask yourself this. Do I really want to see clearly? That's what we just need to ask ourselves. Do you really want to see clearly? You know, I can't make you see clearly because it's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And it's what He's come to do. To guide you into all truth. 
to convict the world of sin. So I'm not going to actually come up this morning, but I just want you to, to just think about what, what some of the things I said in the message. Every one of you have been in a position, in a place, that you didn't understand why you were there. You prayed and, and you didn't get an answer. And uh, you had, you know, something's happened in your life where you just cannot stop the sin. And you said, I prayed and I sought God and it's still, it's still happening. And I really just want to be delivered from it. You know, and I, I'm not trying to be mean when I say this. I can only say this about myself is that all the times I have said I wanted to be delivered, I didn't really mean it. I mean, I didn't even know that. I thought I meant it. Until the Lord opened my heart and said, you're not, you're not to the breaking point yet. You're not to the place to really want it out. You're actually enjoying it. No, I'm not, Lord. Every time, you know, I'm finished thinking on it or whatever, I feel so convicted. He said, of course, because you're saved. And you're going to have to reach a place that, that, that grief and that guilt will, will cause you to say no next time. You know, it's the only way God can test us to see if we're really His. He knows. You don't know. Abraham, take your son up on a mountain and kill him. At the end, he, the Lord said, Now I know you, will hold anything back. you won't hold anything back from me. But he knew it already. Abraham found out. Because he said, I believe that he would have even raised him from the dead. So I will obey. You know, so some of the things that plague us... God, God will deal with them. But it's always what we like. I'm not plagued with some, something off the chart that I'd never even thought about. Because that's ridiculous. What I have to deal with in my flesh is things that my flesh likes. And until I can get to the place that I despise it like God does, it's probably going to hang in there and beat me half to death. And make me feel so guilty. But let me ask you a question. Don't you want to do something for God? Don't you have loved ones and friends that really need to be saved? Don't you want to see God's revival move in, especially here in New Orleans area where we live, and, and really do something in people's lives? Of course you do. You're a Christian. That's what Christians want. But we always say, Lord, I want to do something for you. Next thing you know, you get so beat up from the enemy. And he attacks you. Next thing you do, you fall into some pet sin or something. Get up. And you'll get stronger. Let the Lord wash your feet. Repent of your sins. And just cry out for strength. Lord make me strong. In Psalm 51. I'll close with this. David failed with Bathsheba. And he said in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit O Lord. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. And restore unto me. The joy of my salvation. And then I will go and I will guide people on the path to bring them back from destruction. How I know that one? Because I could have wrote that song. Amen. Everybody in here could have wrote that song. It's a real song David wrote for his failure. And God did exactly what he asked him to do. He gave him a new heart. Father, I pray over everyone here this morning. I pointed out one particular thing in this whole message and it had to do with having the perfect sight. So Father, I just pray for them, O oh Lord, that they will take to heart what you have spoken to them about. That they will know that there's something above the cloud that's beautiful and they can never even begin to imagine it. They have to see it. And you will touch their eyes and cause them to see it if they really want it. So I lift them up to you, Father, and I just pray. I pray your grace and your mercy upon them. And I just ask, in Jesus' name, you bring them to that place, because they need to see it. In Jesus' name, amen.